Now, when we talk about the attributes of God, some of these attributes he shares with his people and other attributes he does not share with his people. This is what we call communicable and incommunicable uh, or or non-communicable attributes of God. And so uh, when we looked last week at the wrath of God, for instance, uh, we saw that this was a communicable attribute, um, but not in the same way that we would demonstrate the wrath of God like he does. Firstly, we don't have the power or the authority, but also that we could see that there were ways in which that attribute has been shared with us. Uh, One of the easiest ones to see as a communicable attribute is the holiness of God. Only God is perfect and pure and holy, uh, set apart as God is. He is is high and above us, but he has shared this attribute with us, and we know this because he actually commands us to holiness, he instructs us. So God himself is holy, and he requires that we are holy. So it's a communicable attribute um, to us. When we looked at the sovereignty of God, however, we saw clearly that the sovereignty of God is not a communicable attribute. Uh, it's an incommunicable attribute because God uh, is, not, is not sharing that with us. He alone is sovereign. Human beings are not sovereign. And when human beings try to be sovereign, that's when tyranny happens. Uh, that's the reason why when you don't have God above your government, that the government goes towards tyranny, uh, dictatorship, because they aren't accountable um, to God above them. And so sovereignty alone belongs to God. And so we're looking tonight at the love of God, which is absolutely a communicable attribute. But as I said, we're just going to think about uh, defining love in general. And if somebody put you on the spot, you only had a, a moment to think, and they said, give me a definition for love. What would you do? How would you define it? What are the, the words that you might go to? And I thought, well, I'm just going to have a look at uh, uh, what, what some of these dictionary versions uh, are going to give me when it comes to just you know, Googling love and seeing what the definition is. And so the Cambridge uh, says that love is to like another adult very much <laughs> and be romantically and sexually attracted to them or to have strong feelings or liking a friend or person in your family. That's, that's Cambridge. <laughs> now, here's the problem with a non-biblical version of love. Like when you try to seek a definition, or try to understand love without God in the picture, um, what you're doing is, and we've got to understand total depravity first and foremost, you're coming to a human being, an individual, who we have to remember is fallen because of sin. So that means that not only have we sinned and broken God's laws, it means that our intellectual faculties are also, are also damaged impaired, so you, so you could say, as a result of this. And, and it's because of this that we end up with certain phrases like people then going, well, love is love. How would you define that based on all of the range of, of um, uh, things we just took out of the dictionary there? Love is love. It's just open. It's just whatever. It really comes down to what we see in modern society, unbelievers using the word love, uh, being ultimately about peace people's feelings and emotions. Um, love being about what feels good to you, what seems right, what, what is your warm emotions, and, and then also sexual desires apparently in, in the mix of that as well. And so the result of allowing human beings to define love means that people love as long as they have these warm feelings and these strong emotions towards a person or towards a thing. That's what we see there. They have... Uh, the, the love remains as long as the warm feelings remain, the emotions and the, the strong desires remain. And this is why then that people come apart because when warm feelings are not present, they start to question because they have a, a, a faulty version of what love is. And so the word gets quite flippantly used in modern thinking because non-biblical love comes and it goes. And that's just the way it is. It's just, well, I loved this person for a period of time, but I no longer love them. Sadly, that creeps into the church as well, where people will say to each other that they, that they love them, but it doesn't take much for people then to, well, I don't have those same feelings. Well, have they come by the word of God and defined their love in accordance with, with scripture again? The word gets misused in the church, often in another, in another way, which, is, which is, should be a concern to us, in that 
Christians can often think that love means niceness, not upsetting people, that it is just about being uh, non-confrontational and seeking to keep the peace, which is ultimately a, a false peace. It's just where no truth gets to the surface and nothing gets to uh, uh, get explored and, and, and truly understood. But here's what the issue is. When we come to God's word, you can never, ever, ever separate the love of God from God's truth. They can't be separated, all right? 1 Corinthians, verse 13, 4 to 6 says this, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its way. It is not irritable or resentful, right? And so there's this description now being given about what love is and what it, what it looks like. And we know this so well because we've been to weddings and it's a very common verse to bring out in a wedding situation because we're talking about love between a man and a woman. And so we're describing it by the scriptures. But look at what comes in verse 6. It says, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. It rejoices in the truth. It is connected. It is fused together with it. And this is why then it says in Ephesians 4 verse 15 that when we speak the truth, we're going to do this in love because these things come together, right? Love and truth come together. So therefore, to understand love and have a true definition, we must, must come to God through his word. It is here that we find out, as we've already heard in the passage, God is love. God himself is love. Let's hear it again from the passage. It says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. All right, so it moves very quickly, the passage here, to saying and making this, this very, very bold statement that love is not just something that God has as a characteristic, but that he himself is love. In the same way that we say God is holy, God is righteous. These are the other attributes, right? God is good. So to have any goodness, holiness, uh, uh, love has to be connected to the true and living God of the universe. So let me read this again. It says, anyone who does not, does, uh, does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. So here is now how you will see and understand, which is that God sent his only son into the world so that, he might live, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. So already, we're going to pack this a little bit more shortly, but God himself is love. How do I know I've got to be looking towards Christ? So to understand God's love already has to become a gospel conversation because we're looking at Christ who was sent into the world for us to be seeing this love that was then manifest and demonstrated to us. So it's not simply that God is loving or that he loves his people. It's not enough to say that. We must firstly define love by saying God himself is love. And so since God is love, that means, what this, what this means to us is that love is his very nature. It's his very character. It's, his, it's who he is. It's not just part of who he is. It is who he is. Being that he is love means that there is no malice and no wickedness in him. Things that are opposite to love then, right? He is, he is none of those things. There is no sin in him. There is no corruption to be found in him. And so what we need to say then, as we, as we understand this, is just that in the same way that everything God does is just because he is a God of justice, or we say everything that God does is good uh, because he is, he is good himself. Or we say that God, everything that he does is uh, demonstrating holiness because he is holy is the same principle here that what he does is love. Everything that God does is loving because God is love. Um, this is the reason why when we say things about his wrath that we looked at last week, uh, 
that we would say things like, you know, even God's um, righteous wrath is exactly that. It is righteous and it is just because that is his character. And uh, God is love and therefore the things that come from him are love. So let's describe his love a little bit, a little bit more biblically. Uh, we're going to put some words to this to, to flesh this out a little bit more. God's word reveals more to us about what God's love is like. So some key words to deepen our knowledge of God's love is this. God's love is uninfluenced. God's love is uninfluenced, which means that it is not influenced by any other person or thing. There is nothing that is causing God's love when he looks external to himself. Um, Our love is certainly influenced. Um, But what we read here in Deuteronomy Chapter 7, verses 7 to 8, it says this. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. So this is the conversation of uh, Moses, right? Uh, And he's demonstrating the attributes of God as he's talking about who, who God is. And you weren't chosen because you were more in number and said, hey, you look like a good, a good group of people to love because there's a lot of you and you're probably going to be more powerful than another nation if I, if I raise you up correctly, right? Uh, it wasn't because they were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you for. It's the opposite of that. He says, for you were the fewest of all peoples. So it wasn't that you were impressive, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So that's the first thing. God's love is not influenced. It is uninfluenced. His love for his people is not influenced by us. And that's actually really, really good news because we're not trying to influence God and get him to love us. The scriptures have revealed to us that God loves us and chose us in him before the foundation of the world. God chose to love us. Why? Because our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. Because it is his good pleasure to do so. So his love is uninfluenced. Second word that we should put to this is God's love is eternal. God's love is eternal. Since God himself is eternal and since God is love, his love is likewise eternal. It doesn't run out. So again, going back to the human thinking of Hey, I'm, I'm done with this person or these people have come apart because the, 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 the warm feelings and the, the certain uh, uh, things that were there have now moved away and I don't have those same. And so my, my love has grown cold. They, they, a person might be thinking of another. This is not the case with God because God himself is eternal. His love is likewise eternal. You cannot exhaust God's love for you. He is never emptied of his love for us and so what that means then is that God's love has no limits he doesn't run out Uh, the next one that we should have here describing God's love and what it is like is the word unchangeable God's word is uh, God's love is unchangeable and Renz also dealt with this in the 1689 one of the words that we use for talking about God's character and God being unchanging is the word immutable immutable means that he is unchanging and so when we say that God is immutable we're saying he doesn't change and the result of that is therefore his attributes do not change so he does not change his love also does not change and then the final word I want to give you tonight is gracious when we explain God's love we would say that it is a gracious love Grace is a gift that has been given to those who did not earn it, right? Um, there's a, a, an acronym that gets used, God's riches at Christ's expense, right? We, we obtain the love of God. We are receiving these blessings by God, yet we did not deserve them because we did not earn them in any particular way. We were sinners, dead in our sins, enemies with God, all right? And so... The love that God has for us is a gracious gift. We haven't earned it. We haven't labored for this gift. And when we think about a gift, that's exactly what it is. It's not something that you have earned. You don't 
reach into your pocket to look for money when somebody gives you a gift. The purpose of giving them giving you a gift is to say, I, I want to give this to you. For, for no other reason, I love you. And this is a gift that has been given. So God's love is given and it's gracious because it's not deserved. Right? When we want to use this word not deserved, we have to understand rightly what is it that human beings deserve. Human beings deserve death. That's what the wages of our sin is, right? So Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the wages of your sin is death. So what you've actually worked for, what you've actually labored for is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so that's why we can say that God's love is gracious, uh, given to us, although it is not deserved. Now, we've hinted at this already because we've seen it in the, in the verse of 1 John. Uh, but we're going to come to John 15, verse 13, where we can understand God's love is known through Christ's death for us. So we've described it. We've fleshed out some words to uh, see that God himself is love. We've described his love. And we've already said that it's manifest in Christ Jesus being sent to the world. And John 15 is going to help us get a bit more specific with that. John 15 verse 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So the greatest example ever seen of God's love is demonstrated at the death of Christ at the cross. We remember that this is where we see also his righteous wrath demonstrated. We saw that last week. So at the cross, we're seeing God's wrath demonstrated, but at the same time, we are seeing the love of God demonstrated. This is where we see it as his people. Romans 5 verse 7 to 8 says this, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. Verse 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If we were ever put into a situation where we might have to give our life for somebody else, not a, not a very nice thought that we, we would want to put ourselves in. But I think there's, a, there's some truths that we would like to believe about ourselves that if I was put in this situation, I think I could give my life for another, which would be giving your life for somebody who is very dear to you, um, a parent giving their life in place of their child or uh, a, a, a husband or wife, you know, and, and a husband uh, laying down his life for his wife whom he adores, right? This would be uh, I think if we were thinking of how we would like to answer, we would want to be able to say, or I think most people would want to be able to do that. Outside of that, maybe, maybe there is a time, for instance, in, in war and, and conflict where somebody's life is laid down for others. And that's for a, a, a greater cause. And, and it's for a, a certain person or people in mind who, who you love or a country that you love in, in this kind of way. But what about somebody that you might even think of now who's been an enemy to you? What about laying down your life for somebody who you've had great hostility with in life? You would say you're at enmity with that person. and Maybe you're no longer, but maybe you remember what that was like when you were uh, uh, in that place with, with that person. And we might start to think then, yeah, I'm not sure if I would lay my life down for that particular person. I remember those things that they actually said about me. In fact, I remember the things that they did to me at that particular time in life. But you know what? That is exactly what Christ has done for his people. So let me read that again with this in mind. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. So maybe for a good person, they might, they might do it. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. And we know elsewhere that it is said that, that we, we understand we are at enmity with God, which means we're his enemies. Christ died for his enemies, that they would become his. This is exactly what Christ has done. While we were still sinners, Jesus gave his life for us. 
He did not wait for us to try and produce our own righteousness so that we could measure up or that we could be lovable. He gave his life for us when we were unlovable, while we were still sinners. The death of, death of Jesus for his people is the greatest act of love that a holy and righteous God without sin would give his life for the unrighteous and the undeserving. His, he loved us and showed mercy to us while we were still objects of his wrath. While we were still objects of wrath, he showed us love and mercy. So just as God's wrath was poured out, and, and, and going back to our thinking of last week, right? think about how significant uh, and bringing wrath and love in together at the cross is in this particular uh, understanding here is that we recognize God's wrath like we saw last week poured out upon the earth in the days of Noah the the people of the earth destroyed under God's wrath we remember cities that are brought to ruin as God raises up his people to destroy wicked doers we remember Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed and brought to rubble the land so left so desolate you couldn't even grow crops in there this is the furious and violent anger of the righteous wrath of God that is, that is poured out on the uh, 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 sinner. And yet when we come to the cross as well, we see that very wrath delivered upon Jesus Christ instead of us. That's exactly the same outpouring of wrath. But rather than upon the sinner, Christ has taken that wrath in his body because he loves his people. And he will demonstrate the glory of God in all of this, but he loves his people. And when he came on that mission, where he left his heavenly home, and he came to us, as Matthew 1 said, he died for the sins of his people, his people whom he loves. Um, we must see both of these attributes demonstrated at the cross. God's wrath was poured out upon Christ instead of us for our sins. He has showed mercy to us, those whom Christ loves, all those who have believed upon Jesus Christ through his death and his resurrection. And 1 Peter verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 24 says this to us, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. He himself bore our sins. And so we should then ask, well, studying God's characteristics like this and, and, and learning his attributes, the natural place, and this is where we're going to land this this evening, is to ask them, well, what does this mean for our lives? We can ask things, and a great question is, well, if this has taken place, if God loved his people so much that he poured out his wrath on his son that we might be saved, what then should we do in response? How should we live in the light of the love of God in our lives? Well, the first thing I would bring out for us is this. The love of God teaches us that we are to warn other people about, about sin, about judgment, because this is loving to do so. It's got to be there on our list of things of how we understand God's love to impact our lives. Because again, this is not worldly definitions of warm fuzzies and, and, and feelings-based love, right? This is that God poured out his wrath upon his son that all who would call upon his name would be saved. And so we should be those who love people as God loves us, that we will warn them of God's wrath and punishment. And likewise, we will tell them then of God's great love that is found in Christ and in Christ alone. We will point them to have not a worldly version of love, but to understand what love is when they come to God who himself is love. So he loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him will have life and have it eternally. The second thing we should point out for how does the love of God impact our lives, our day-to-days, uh, uh, -day is that it, has, uh, it will teach us of the security of God, the security that we as believers have in God through Jesus Christ. Again, timely that our 1689 gave us this as well. Confidence and security in God for believers is the outcome of studying God's love, of truly understanding the attribute. Because since God's love is unchanging, then his love is not going to change toward you. He will not stop loving us or love us less. He will not love us differently in the future than what he loves us now. He will not love us differently in the future than when he loved us from before the foundation of the world. His love is unchanging. It is immutable. It is therefore that we can say we have eternal security in God 
and it's demonstrated to us in love. And, and I, I don't think I could give you a better passage that, that, that I can think of tonight to, to point you to that security and, 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 and affirm to you the love that God has for you than taking you to Romans 8, 35 and 37. And you know the verse, but I want you to turn to it because I want you to see it in yours, knowing that this is you, child of God, son, daughter of the, of the living God, and you're hearing this, and this, is, this should be speaking to you. Romans 8, 35, 37 says this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? This is Paul using these, uh, um, th- these rhetorical questions, right? He means no one is going to separate you from the love of Christ. That's what he means. He's not, he's not asking for your input here, right? He's not, think, he's not trying to get to you to see whether you can think of anyone who could separate you, right? He's making official statements here. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Like look at that list that he's just given you there. This is the very thing that people wrestle with when they say, I don't think that God loves me because you should have seen my life. Right, have a look at the love that God has for Paul, yet look at the things that Paul went through in life. Have a look at Christ himself who took on the sins of his people on the, on the cross and was crushed. Yet the Father loves the Son eternally. And so even if your life meets tribulation, even if your life meets distress or persecution, even if you were to have been uh, one who lived through one of the terrible famines or a famine that might yet come, even if you were to somebody who would suffer under violence of peril, sword, or nakedness, meaning having nothing to put on yourself because you were that poor, nothing of those things can separate you from the love of God that he has for you. There's a very reason we can be like we were this morning saying that to live is Christ, but to die is gain. There is a security and confidence that you have in the eternal love of God that he has for you. He says this in verse 36, as it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are eternally secure in the love of God. May this be a blessing. May it be a stirring up and a reminding of you. And the result of this, of knowing this eternal love is, what do you do when you know that God loves you like this? You run towards him. You go towards him regularly, often. And when you mess up and you sin and you fall short of his good standards, because of his great love for you, it drives you towards him, not away from him, like you're scared of some, some uh, person who's going to punish you and, and severely hurt you. You run towards him because you know your security is in him at all times. Yes, he'll discipline you, rightly so, because he loves you. But may these verses and this teaching draw us closer to him once again. Uh, Finally, we should say then that this then is the true place that we will have love for others. If we understand the attribute of God, that God is love and what he has done, then we can truly love other people with a biblical and genuine love. Not a worldly version not a version I made up or somebody else made up, but a biblical version. We can actually love other people. Um, and this is what John 15 verses 12 to 13 teaches us. He's, God says, this is my commandment, right? Jesus gives us this and says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you. So the, 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 the place that we look then for, well, how do I love people? Because some days I don't feel like I love people, right? Right? How do I love people that, uh, that, that to me are, uh, are difficult? And, you know, often in those times, we're not realizing we're the difficult one, probably, you know. But the reality is, God didn't just love us when we were difficult. He loved us while we were his enemies, while we were undeserving and sinners. And therefore, we can grow in the love of God ourselves for each other. And we should see our love for others in two places. We should see it in two places. Firstly, we should see it in the church. Right? God puts a, a great, great emphasis throughout all of his word on the love that we are to have 
for, for the church, for brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, the local church is the place where we live out these commands that we are to be devoted to each other, that we are to bear with one another, carry each other's burdens, be prayerful for each other. You can't do that from a distance. You need the local church and a group of people that are committed to you and you are committed to. And so the first place when we talk about loving others, it's easy for people, uh, I think, to sort of jump to, you know, I'm going to love the poor. I'm going to love the, the, you know, the unlovable. I'm going to go like there. You, if you're not loving the church, you haven't got the starting point of that. Because God loves the church so much that Christ died for the church. That's how much he, he laid down his life for his bride. And so therefore, if we are going to truly be loving people, um, demonstrating, uh, aligned with the purposes of God, then the first place is that we practice this love in the local church. We love the brothers and sisters in the household of God, just as God has loved us. And furthermore, we are also to love the outsider, to demonstrate the love of God, um, of course, through our outreach, through our various givings, through, um, of course, helping the poor and the needy and those who have, uh, have a great need. Um, but it, once again, it is demonstrated to us in the person of Christ who laid down his life for us. And so as I bring this to a close tonight, I want you to think back to the time when you first experienced the love of God at the point of your salvation. When you realized that you were a sinner, when you realized that you had broken his commandments and you recognized Christ actually died in my place. I want to leave you with that so that you will remember and highlight the love of God for you personally tonight. Um, let's pray together. Father, I just thank you tonight as we've been studying your attributes and... Uh, Lord, I, I thank you that we can uh, not be swayed by the faulty versions of love that we see in the world around us, that we are uh, guided in truth by your scriptures that teach us about you and that you have this great love for us that is demonstrated in Christ who laid down his life for us. While we were enemies, while we were still sinners, that you have done this for us, Lord. And so, uh, Father, I pray that we will look to you as the example that our love for one another will be uh, a sacrificial love, just like you have given to us. Um, I pray, Lord, let us, as we've looked in 1 Corinthians 13, we saw those, uh, the descriptions of love and that it is patient and kind. And I pray, Lord, that we might be patient and kind towards one another. I pray that you will grow us in this by your spirit. I pray that our love for one another does not envy or boast. Uh, I pray, Lord, that our love is not arrogant or rude. I pray that our love does not insist on, uh, uh, that we, we aren't insisting on getting our own way. Lord, I pray that our, our love is looking to you and, and helping us not to be irritable or resentful. Lord, help us deal, deal with our hearts in this regard. And I pray, Lord, that our, our, our lives would not rejoice in wrongdoing, but that our love will rejoice in the truth, the truth of your word, the truth of Christ who has given everything for us. And so, Father, grow us in this attribute also. Thank you that you communicate this, you share this with us, that you will grow us as people who are genuinely and truly loving of each other as you have loved us. We pray this tonight and ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks, everyone. We'll uh, give.